this morning, I, I want to continue from our sermon series on the glory of God or being established in glory. And I want to preach about glorification. Somebody say glorification. You didn't say it well. Say glorification. Glory and fication. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. Glorification. Establishing in glory. So from the first day that Pastor Lord began, he made us aware that everything that God stands for is glory. Somebody say glory. And that is what his son manifested in John chapter 1. He says that he saw, we saw his fullness. We saw the glory of God. That is the first time man ever saw God in human form. So God came in human form. He manifested his glory and all eyes saw him. But in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, he says that the eyes of your understanding be opened. Paul praying for the Ephesian church. That you may know the hope of his calling. So you cannot only or always say you are born again or you are saved without knowing why you are saved. Without knowing why you call yourself a child of God. Hallelujah. Let's read this scripture so that we see something. So... This one will, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it will give us an idea of God's intent for man and why Jesus came on earth. Hallelujah. Let's read together. For all have sinned and fall short of what? The glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Of God. So what did man lose from God? The glory. Hallelujah. So what man lost was the glory. So because of sin, the glory that man was having, sharing with God, he lost it. So this is the intent why Jesus came on earth to die for you and I. And what is the purpose? To restore us back into that glory. Somebody say, we have we are been restored. So this morning, I want to read some scriptures. Let's read to 25, and then we read 2 Peter 1.13. Let's continue. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So our justification is in Christ. It's in Jesus that we are justified. It is in Jesus that we are restored back to the glory that God has for us. You are not restored to the glory of God because you are, excuse me to say, a virgin. Or you, are, you have never committed any sin before. But you are restored based on the finished work of Christ. Based on what he did on the cross for you. So your accepting what he did is your justification. It's how you are restored back to the glory that the son has with the father. Hallelujah. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in what? Christ Jesus, verse 25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 5, verse 10 to 11. So it is in through Christ, it's through his finished work, his, um, his death, his burial, resurrection and ascension that we identify with. That is how come we are restored back to the glory that God shared with us. Somebody will ask the question, if we have been restored back to the glory of the Lord, why is it that I am still sinning? Why is it that I'm still having some weaknesses and other things in my life? Why is it that there's still darkness all around me? I'm going through pain. We will answer that as we go along. Are, are we together? Hallelujah. Forgive me. My body is tired, but my mind is not tired. <laughs> but, okay, let's start from nine. Okay, so we get more understanding. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, the same affliction that you are going through, the same suffering you go through, whatever you are passing through, people who are not born again, they are also experiencing the same thing. But God has given you the grace to be able to resist the devil. That is your identification with him and the authority you have in him. Verse 10, he says what? But may the God of all grace, 
who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. That, does he answer the first one that we read? Romans 3. So, God has called us to a certain glory, but this one, that glory is an eternal one. It's an eternal glory. It's not a transient glory. A glory that dissipates. The Bible says in Colossians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, that Moses, when he came from the mountain, his countenance changed because of the glory of the Lord that was on his face. But that glory was to be done away. It was a temporal one, but people could not see his face. They couldn't look at him. But you, by the grace of God, you have the glory of God with you and inside of you. I will explain later. It is in you as a seed. Somebody say, as a seed. Let me ask you this question. Maybe you will answer for me. Are you born again? Are you born again? How do you know? Very good. As the Lord said, the conviction in his heart tells him. That is number one. Number two is what? Because the scriptures... This is your standard. This is what tells you that you are born again. And then once you receive that, the conviction aligns with what the word says. And then it makes you more bold and bold to yearn more from the Lord. So the same scripture should give you the conviction that the glory of the Lord is inside of you. The same scripture should give you that strength and the, the, the foundation. It should be the fulcrum on which you stand to say, I have been called or restored into the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Though you are born again, but you are not seeing any changes. When Agnes was born again, the same, the same size, still the same. When Newman was born again, I think I've even shrinked more. <laughs> Hallelujah. Your body doesn't change. But it's a spiritual work that has gone on inside of you. And it is a work of faith. Somebody say a work of faith. So in believing or in uh, seeing the glory of the Lord, in experiencing it, it has to be a journey of faith. It has to be something that you believe in yourself. That I have been uh, what restored. I have been called to what? His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After he have suffered a while, make you what? Perfect. Establish you, strengthen and settle you. Let's read 2 Peter 1 verse 13. 2 Peter 1 13. Hallelujah. This week I made a mistake. I went to preach somewhere. I didn't take my Bible. And lucky enough, I went with someone. So I took his own. When I went, there was no screen. <laughs> and I left my phone also in his car. <laughs> so I would have been in serious trouble. Hallelujah. I say that to say, where's your Bible? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody say, somebody's pointing to me and the screen is his Bible. Hallelujah. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in his tent or this tent to stir you up by bringing you. Are we reading 2 Peter 1.13? Okay. By bringing you or reminding you, next verse, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent He's talking about his body. That is Peter. So this body shall be put away for us to experience a certain body. That body is the same body that Jesus is having. We have not yet entered into heaven itself. As in going with him physically. But we are in heaven as we are seated. Because if you leave this place, that is where you are going. Or except you have not believed. But if you have believed, you are there and you are here. Somebody say, I'm there and I'm here. So it means that you are between two worlds. You are in his realm, his world, and you are also here. So you have tasted of the power yet to come whilst you are here. So that power which is yet to manifest on earth, you can walk in it. You can meditate in it. You can look at it like the way Enoch envisaged, looked at it, meditated on it until he entered into heaven. So the glory of the Lord is a seed in you. You will, you will definitely put away this tent which is frail and weak. There is a glory that is about to be manifested in you or out of you. You can start experiencing that glory, walking in that glory, even now till the time that Jesus comes and gives you a body that will be, not be sick anymore. Hallelujah. He has made a down payment of that seed inside of you. 
That is what identifies him with you. My understanding of rapture is that the Holy Ghost is in me. And the Holy Ghost, I see it this way, like those who study physics. Wherever a magnet is, when he sees a metal, it will what? Pick it up. So if the Holy Ghost is going, anything that identifies with it, it will go with it. So once I have the Holy Spirit in me, he's going, he magnets me, and then I disappear. And then you will see general news, GN news. They are gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when the Holy Spirit is living, he lives with you because he has a deposit of himself in you. Hallelujah. You are not lost. Somebody say, I'm not lost. We are in light whilst we are here. You may be experiencing darkness and light as in walking in life and also by way of what? Nature, which is day and night, but you are already in light. Hallelujah. So just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me, he showed to Peter that his glory shall be made manifest. There is a glory that is about to be revealed in you, that will be shown in you. If you leave this tent, that glory shall show forth. Hallelujah. The same First Peter chapter 1, verse 11, and then we jump to 21. When man sinned, he brought sin into the world or into the human world. Sin was already in the universe or in the, in the world. I find it difficult to pray certain prayers or say some confessions when some people are saying, say this, that the universe will give you this and that and that. Sin was already in the universe. Who created the universe? It means God. Why don't you say God will give you this and then you will rather say that the universe will bless you. The universe will give you this. It's the new age saying, hallelujah, for people to acknowledge that God is the owner of the universe, they don't want to acknowledge it. So they will say, rather tell you that the universe will give you a blessing as you are going. In the universe, Satan can answer you. In the universe, trees can answer you. Because there are spirits that move around and they can give you a blessing because Satan also can bless. Hallelujah. So rather say, the blessings of the Lord makes rich and ask no soul. Acknowledge God as the source of whatever you have. Let people know that indeed you serve the true one God. He is the source of everything. So people are shy to say that God is the source of this. God is, a, because the moment they say it, people begin to question them. And that is where you fall short because you have no understanding of the God you are serving. You, can, you don't know why you are saved. You don't know where you are being called on to. That is why we are treating this, so that you will know that you are being restored to his glory. In the Old Testament, he will tell us that God does not share his glory with any man. But this scripture, what is he saying? We are being called into his eternal glory. He has shared the glory with you. Or he didn't share it with you. I'm talking about maybe God does something for you. You know that God is the one that did it. So you will not say you did it. So you are giving God glory. But when it comes to the realm of your existence, where you are existing, you are existing in God's glory. You are there physically. It is not a, lit, uh, what do you call it? It's not metaphorical. It's literal. That's why I asked you the question. What makes you think or believe that you are saved? And you say, by conviction and also the scripture. So it has to also tell you that you are in the glory. Hallelujah. It is not something you are wishing, but you are there. What made Peter's shadow heal the sick and raise the dead? When there is glory, sickness disappears. When the glory of the Lord, let me bring this scripture as I'm going ahead of myself. It says, your body is the temple of what? The Holy Ghost. Your body is the temple of what? Your body is the temple of what? So it means that God's promise to you is that his intent from the beginning has been to dwell in man and to dwell in your body. So it means that God will, or the Holy Spirit will move from your spirit and sit on your body or sit in your body. That is what we call glorification. Glorification is when the Holy Spirit takes possession of your entire body and your human frailties or your weaknesses disappears. Hallelujah. That is glorification. So your body that you have now, somebody says, it's not my own. And even the life you are living, the Bible says, Paul said, I live not the life of my own, but the life of the Son of God who dwells in me. It is not your own. 
So, in other words, I have good news for you. You are a born slave to Christ. Your body is not your own. You can't use it for what you want to use it for. That's why he tells us that as a man, your body is not your own. When your wife says you want to give it to her. As a woman, when you're, you no complaining. It's not for, uh, hallelujah. <laughs> uh, Jesus. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. <laughs> okay, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. So it means that when Christ suffers, there is a glory that will follow him. This is Peter saying that the prophets, whatever they wrote, they wrote about one coming. As the Lord taught us in that sermon series, uh, what do you call it? Going through the Old Testament, finding Christ in the Old Testament, all the stories and all the figures, metaphors and all that. So you should be able to know. I said that the Bible is not about you. You have a story, but within your story, God has a bigger plan. So he used everyone in the Bible and still brought his son out of them. Hallelujah. So you are suffering, but in your suffering, his agenda is playing out. You are going through pain, but in your pain, God's agenda is playing out. So you leave the earth, and then people begin to, oh, okay, God did this through Pastor Lord. But at the end, Christ has showed up. Hallelujah. So the prophets wrote about Christ and testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. So it means that there was a form of glory, or there was a particular glory that will follow what? His suffering. The glory with which God has for us or the whole mission of Christ was about the glory of the Lord. The glory is the life and nature with which God has desired us to be restored back into. This is what he has desired that we be restored back into. He didn't desire that we be restored into anything else than his glory. Somebody say his glory. Let's read 1 John chapter 3 verse 8. So the main purpose of Christ coming in human form was to restore the lost glory of man. Restore us back to the glory. So for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. It means they have missed the mark. There was a separation, a gap between man and God. There was that gap. When the devil sinned, his sin was eternal. The devil's sin was an eternal sin. Man's sin was a spiritual sin. Eternal sin cannot be reversed. It means the devil cannot be called back. He cannot be saved again. There are theories when you do theology. There are theories that suggest that the devil will be born again. He can never be born again. He was with God and he left. We, we were not with God. We were in Eden. Hallelujah. His presence comes and goes. But the death that man died was spiritual death. And spiritual death can be reversed back by eternal what? Life. Eternal life reverses spiritual death, but eternal death cannot be reversed. Maybe you didn't understand the two words. He says what? He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. He sinned what? From the beginning. I understand this. When we say from the beginning, it means the beginning of time. If we say before the beginning or before the foundations of the world, it means that it is not within man's realm. So from the beginning here means it was within the time of man. When time kicks start. Hallelujah. So he, he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of God was what? Manifested. Why did he manifest or why did he come or appear on earth? That he might destroy the works of the devil. What is the works of the devil? The nature of the devil that man swallowed up, man bought into, man received inside of him. Adam received the nature of the devil. This tree is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This tree is the tree of life. So you can eat of all of them. But he rather ate the one that contains good and evil. So he partook of the nature of the devil. Hallelujah. And died. So God has to restore him. And this is why God what? Came. The term glory is the apparent presence. Accompanying power. Glory is what? The presence of God. His accompanying power and brilliance manifested to man. The presence of the Lord, 
his son or the Holy Spirit. Wherever you see the Holy Spirit, wherever you see the Lord, wherever you see his son, the glory of the Lord is in that place. Hallelujah. Just like wherever a king will go, his throne is there. So when the king moves, except politicians, hallelujah, <laughs> you go by the time you come, they have... <laughs> now they carry their own. Eh? <laughs> hallelujah. So the main purpose for glory in your life is to make and establish one as a heavy weight in spiritual matters. The main purpose of the glory of the Lord is to establish you as a heavy weight in the spiritual matters of God. Hallelujah. Glory is an automatic deposit of the anointing. When we are talking about the anointing, we are talking about presence. We are talking about the Holy Ghost. We are talking about what? The glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, amen. There is a connection between the glory and the anointing. When the anointing of God is working here, which is the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, we will see people start getting healed and they are glorifying who? They are glorifying God. They won't glorify the one or the vessel with which things are being done, but the one who is doing the things through that vessel. Hallelujah. I said last week that anywhere you see the glory of God manifesting, it means man is there. Man is has allowed himself or herself to be used by God. So people are seeing God in that man. People are seeing God in that place. There is transformation going on in that same place. Hallelujah. Oh, amen. Are you following me? Please don't get lost. So when you are born again, the glory of God is credited to your spirit. Somebody say it's credited to my spirit. It's inside you. It's a deposit. It comes to stay in you. It comes to live in you. Just like you are born again, but you don't see the born again on your body. <laughs> Just like you are saved, but you don't see the salvation on your body. But the salvation is within. So when you begin to pay attention to the word of the Lord and begin to meditate on the Lord and walk with the Holy Spirit, what is inside begins to manifest outwardly. Are we together? So the glory begins to flow out for people to see the glory of God is Christ in you. Hallelujah. <laughs> when you are, you, are, you are young in the faith, we will say, born again, being saved. But when you are maturing, we will say, God is living in you. It's hard to swallow, but God is living in you. That means that you have grown from feeding on milk and now you are chewing bones. You are beginning to understand who you are in Christ. You are beginning to know why you have been called as a child of God. You are beginning to, anywhere anybody asks you why you are saved, you will be able to stand to defend the faith, to know that, okay, I am saved because of this. I have been given the ministry of reconciliation to reconcile men back to God. Hallelujah. That is the ministry we have. We have thought about this, that every child of God has a ministry, and that is the ministry of reconciliation, to reconcile men back onto the glory that they have with God. And that glory is an eternal one. So you have already received the glory that you are going to dwell in. In heaven, they said we are going to walk on gold. Some people say they have been there. Me, I'm praying for that encounter so that I can see. Hallelujah. I've not seen it yet. If you are going to walk on gold, it means that there is something that is more precious or more valuable than gold. Hallelujah. And that is what you have been called into. And that is the glory. Hallelujah. When the glory of the Lord is here, there will be no pain. Glory is the realm where there is no sickness. God in every place is his glory. So can God be sick? Jesus, when he came on earth, was he sick? You heard, did you ever hear or hear that Jesus was in the, uh, is it a Tel Aviv hospital? And Peter and James went there with Kose and Massa to go and visit Jesus. They went there to go and give Jesus bread and cocoa or tea. Jesus was never sick. Why? Because the glory is in him. The Holy Ghost is in him. And that is where we should, we should yearn to. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, it's not a joke. We have to begin to understand who we are. 
We have to begin to know that this is what we are to walk in. And by walking in this, we are representing God on earth. We are demonstrating God everywhere we are. People will begin to see the glory. The glory of God will be seen by men through you. God will not come down and begin to show people there are places where evangelists, we are not going. Then God, by you see, the reason why Jesus can appear to people and witness to them is that he's a man. The gospel is for men to preach. That is, in Acts chapter 12, the angel told Peter, go, and he told Cornelius, send somebody. It is not the work of angels, but it's the work of men. Jesus can appear to people because he is in heaven as a man. There is one man between God, or one mediator between God and men. The man cried Jesus. So he can appear to people and witness to them, and they believe. Hallelujah. So the glory of the Lord manifested through Christ. Jesus, now he can appear everywhere. It should give you a picture of what you are going to enjoy. You think about Yugoslavia and you are there. It's not like you are praying. Or you are now going to queue. I don't know whether you go through America first. Or you go through Egypt. Before you transit. No, this one, there's no transition. There is teleportation. Hallelujah. <laughs> You think about it and you are there. That is the glory of the law. That is how God has called us into. To come and enjoy this. What I'm preaching about is living the glory life. Living the life of what God has called you into. Living or beginning to work on that deposit of his glory. Which is inside of you. Bringing it out so that all eyes can see it. And you can also call men into that same glory. May your eyes be open to understand it. Hallelujah. Oh, amen. Your journey now begins to walk into the glory or the fullness of the glory by working on the one inside of you. You have a journey. You have a walk to walk and to begin to work on that which is inside of you. Whatever God will give us to live life victoriously on earth has been given to us already. Do you believe that? Or I should give you that scripture. According as he is eternal power. Has given us what? All things that pertain to life and what? Godliness. So if you are looking for it, this one I won't quote it. If you won't find it yourself, <laughs> I won't give you the scripture. Hallelujah. There must be a betting to whatever God has given us. There is something that God has already given to you to live life victoriously. The apostles had this revelation. The scriptures never said Peter was sick. He said the mother-in-law was sick. And Jesus went there and healed her. It means that the apostles, they encountered something that, that took them beyond sickness. That took them beyond the realm of men. So they were willing to die even in body. And say, if we are crucified, we are joyful because we know that we are going to enjoy something more supernatural, more glorious than what we are seeing now. Hallelujah. The last time I asked a question in a, mini, a church where I was preaching, I asked the question, so if somebody has entered right now with gun or cutlass and he said, where is the pastor? Who will you point to? <laughs> Have you seen it? <laughs> she didn't point to me. She pointed straight to the husband. It means <laughs> when somebody enters here right now, you will be, but you should be able to stand in front of evil. I'm not saying, you see, <laughs> So, if somebody asks you right now, okay, deny Jesus or I kill you, what will you say? They should kill you. Are you sure you'll be able to? Are you more convinced? This is the question we should be asking ourselves. Hallelujah. What made the apostles being ready to say that we are ready to die or ready to obey God than you that are hindering? They were not afraid of the people that killed Christ. They were not afraid of the people that what fabricated stories and betrayed Jesus and handed him over to the Romans and they crucified them. They were bold because the power of the Lord has what taken control over them, taking possession over them. The glory of the Lord was seen in them and everywhere they went, people saw Christ at work. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to say is that there is a life that God has called you into. He has given you something. It's within you. It is glory. To live that life, begin to work on yourself. Begin to think about it. Whatever God has to give you for you to become a successful Christian, to live life and enjoy life, he has given it to you already. May your eyes be open to see it. Hallelujah. 
So that is the prayer Paul pray for the Ephesians that the understand the eyes of your what understanding will be enlightened. Ephesians 1:17 that you may know the hope of his calling and the exceeding greatness of his power at work towards us who believe. It means that there is a certain power but it's an exceeding one. It is at work in you. It is working for you. If your mind or your, your, your approach towards it does not change, you will live life as if you are not saved, as if you are not born again. Man of God, help me. Is it Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 that he talks about? The heir, as long as he's a child, different nothing from a servant, but it's under tutors and governors. The heir there means that it is you. You are the heir apparent of the throne of God. He says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is what? A child, does not differ at all from a slave. Can you give me NIV? Let's see. Though he's a master of all, you have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness to live life without fear. But you will be beaten by life. You will be suppressed. Life is spiritual. And as you are going through, you have to know that God has given you an authority. He has given you a certain grace that you will be able to live life in strength. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all. NIV. You don't have NIV. What about message or amplify? Hallelujah. I just want to explain something. Okay, ESV. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of what? Everything. Somebody say, I'm the owner of everything. You are the owner of everything, but you have nothing. You are the owner of everything, but everything is suppressing you. Everything is defeating you. It means that, that's why Paul said that the renew, the, there must be a renewal of our mind towards that which we have believed, that which we have received. We have to re begin to renew our mind. We have to get to a place where we are beginning to focus on what Christ has done for us, the power he has given to us, so that we can live life victoriously. I'm not talking about material things. There is something that can bring material things into view. When we are talking about blessing, blessing is not material. Blessing is an intangible force. That is the thing that Abraham, I said Abraham, he released on Jacob. He went into Laban's house without a staff and God began to multiply him. It means that everywhere you go, things begin to what? Magnet towards you. That is blessing. Hallelujah. So blessing is more spiritual. That's why in the Old Testament, those guys, they were serious about what? The prophetic word or prayers that their fathers would pray for them because that is the source of the blessing. So you don't miss it. And Ephesians 1.3 tells us that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. The blessings are spiritual. They are there for us. We have to what? Make sure that we begin to work towards it and see the blessing. Give me back my other scripture. Hallelujah. <laughs> she will be lost. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every spiritual blessing must be birthed. This one is the one I want. Though legally he owns the entire inheritance, you have the inheritance that God has promised or God promised Abraham. He promised his son. You have it. Somebody say, I have it. Verse 2. That's what the message says. He is subject to tutors and administrators until whatever date the father has set for emancipation. Hallelujah. What does that mean? Until you begin to grow spiritually, until you begin to tr renew your mind and what? Transform yourself. You can never walk in the inheritance that the Lord has given to you. You can never begin to see the glory. The glory you have been called into, you will not witness it. Hallelujah. I pray for you and I that after today we'll begin to walk in this glory. The Lord will open our eyes and our understanding to walk in this glory. Hallelujah. So it takes a conscious, deliberate, and disciplined pressing into what God has given to us. You are the heir. You are not a minnow. Oh, give me the verse one. And I think I like message. Let's, let's read that one first. Let me show you the implications of this. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's trying to say, let me show you the implications of this. He has said something before he's saying this one. Hallelujah. Let me show you the implications of this. As long as the heir is a mino, he has no advantage over the slave. 
You are the heir. But things that are of the slave, the devil is the slave. You are not a slave. But the devil's activities, his programmings and schemes will fight you, will beat you. But it takes your understanding, it takes your growth in the knowledge of the Lord for you to begin to experience this. Should I show you the glory of the Lord? In the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the glory of God could enter into things and it comes upon people. It can be in places. But in the New Testament, the glory of the Lord is resident in man. Hallelujah. You are the dwelling place of the glory. You are where the glory is seated. But if you don't begin to think that way, that inheritance, I told you last week that the highest form of inheritance God can ever give you is his glory. And we saw from the scriptures today that he has called us into his eternal glory. If we don't begin to renew our mind, we can't see it. Hallelujah. Oh, amen. So though he's a minor, he has no advantage over the slave. Though legally he owns the entire inheritance, but he cannot get it. Hallelujah. As we begin to develop in the glory of the Lord, we will be able to see the glory at work in people, at work in places, at work in, uh, what do you call it, individual lives. Hallelujah. I want to give you some points. There are some things that you can ride on or you can do to develop the glory of the Lord, which is already in you. Are we following? Or you can see that when it is happening to you, it means that God is using it as a tool to bring the glory that is inside of you. Glorification is when we are baptized into the Father. What do I mean by being baptized into the Father? You are baptized into God himself, which is the immortal one who dwells in unapproachable life. You begin to see his characteristics manifesting in your life. Hallelujah. You begin to see the manifestation of the Lord himself in your life. You are also baptized into the Son. When you are baptized into the Son, it means that you begin to have divinity as a man. You are having the divine or the life of God inside of you as a man. You are walking on it as a man, but you are a God walking about. Hallelujah. The God that we serve, whatever he says, he means it. He will not say he will come and dwell in you and not do what he said. Hallelujah. Once he says he will come, he will come and he has come. You will have to begin to renew your mind and accept it. Just the way that you begin that you are saved. You are not born again today and tomorrow you, are, you, are, you become, uh, should I say, unborn again. Hallelujah. No, you are saved. You don't receive the glory today and tomorrow it dissipates. It is when you are not working on a gift that it becomes dormant. The giftings and callings of God are without repentance. It is dormant in you. It is there. When you begin to give it attention, you see it. Hallelujah. So we are baptized in the Son and we have his divinity as humans in the body. We are baptized in the Holy Ghost to carry the fullness of the Spirit. Jesus Christ came carrying the fullness of the Holy Ghost. You can carry the fullness of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, amen. So number one, beholding him by spending time in his presence. Spending time with him. Spending time in his presence. As you begin to behold the Lord, as you begin to think about this glory, as you begin to look at it, what will happen? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 8. We behold and focus on him until we look like him. We behold until we are formed. Ah, we cover. What is cover? Cover is to pray. Hallelujah. Or speak. So we behold until we are formed. You can never be or carry his glory. You can never experience the glory if you are not beholding. But we all, somebody say we all. It's not only them with us also. But we all with unveiled face. It means that the veil that covered the holy of holies has been torn. There is access before the father for everyone. There is access before the throne for you and for I. It is not only for Pastor Newman. Or for Pastor Lord. It is not for the Archbishop. It's for every child of God. Somebody say, I can see the glory. I can experience the glory. Hallelujah. Let's read together. Like a mass choir. Hallelujah. One to go. But we all, with unveiled face, 
beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So who does the work? It's the Spirit of the Lord. You spend time with the Spirit, give me a message. Once you have brought message today, we'll go with message. Hallelujah. When you spend time with the Spirit, you begin to behold Him. There is a transformation that comes. That is how the glory, that is a deposit already in you, you begin to see. Hallelujah. All of us, somebody say all of us. Nothing between us and God. Hallelujah. Somebody say glory to God. There is nothing between you and God anymore. There is no any Hundios temple where there is some veil. You are going to some temple, they tell you, remove your shoes. No. You come before the Lord. You know that you are coming before your Father. There is no hindrance anymore. Somebody said there is no hindrance. The same way they saw the glory. Ah, you go to some place. Ah, Judge Jehovah, the Spirit of the Lord. Has, no, the Spirit of the Lord he is gentle within us. You are carrying God, but you are moving about. You are carrying the Holy Ghost, but you are still what? Moving about. When the Spirit comes, you don't, it's not, uh, you don't do some gyrations. Hallelujah. The Spirit is inside. Hallelujah. Do you believe you have the Spirit? Do you believe you have the glory? Somebody shout glory! Amen. Hallelujah. I think I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> so nothing between us and God. All of us. Somebody say all of us. Between my son, your son, your daughter, if you lead them to Christ, or you begin to what? Let them focus on the Lord. Jesus was 12, and he was questioning the Sanhedrin. They should have even knew that, no, this... Or this child, if we don't take care of him, he will come and worry us. But they allowed him to grow. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> All of us, nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his face. The glory of the Lord is the face of the Lord. The face of the Lord is what encountered or Moses encountered. So when the glory begins to shine, people cannot look at you. When you begin to walk or work on the glory, witches cannot look at your face. Those that cast spells cannot look at your face. I was in a, a what do you call it, a, a, a taxi with someone. We were going somewhere. And the person was like, oh, I went to somewhere, some village in Benin. He's a traveler, does business. And there's a place that when those that cast spells, they see you, they just look at you like this. And then you follow them and then they'll go and sacrifice you. I said, can we go there? <laughs> uh, look at my face. <laughs> Hallelujah. You look me, I look you. <laughs> no, you don't know the God that is inside of you. God is the one that is look, living inside of you. You should get to a place where you are not afraid. You, are, you don't go to sleep and you are afraid that something will come and press you. Press you. When the thing comes, you press it. <laughs> Hallelujah. You shouldn't be afraid because the glory of the Lord, God himself is living inside of you. Somebody say, I have God inside of me. His glory is in me. My face is shining. With the brightness of his face. Hallelujah. That is what, that's what the Bible says you are. Hallelujah. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Who is the Messiah? Christ is the Messiah. The same way he was transfigured. The same way he ascended. As we begin to behold him, there is nothing that can prevent you or that should prevent you from going to him. There is free access. Let me give you the last two points. I'm done. There is free access to get to him, to go there. There's nothing. That's what forbid you. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and become like him. Hallelujah. When you behold him, this is your story. When you focus on him, this is your story. The glory of the Lord will make your life what? Becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters your life. So allow more of God than allowing more of the world. Hallelujah. Allow more of God. Number two, reading and meditating on the word to become partakers of inheritance. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4. When you focus on the word of the Lord more and you read, you become a partaker of the inheritance of the Lord. Acts chapter 20 verse 32. He says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, how you are built up, or built up as a child of God is by the word of his grace and able to give you an inheritance among them that stand. So for you to get your inheritance, you must focus on the word of the Lord. 
Wake up reading the word before you engage in other activities. Hallelujah. An inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Number three, prayer. Somebody say prayer. There is a level of the glory of God that can come upon you through intense prayer. And Jesus demonstrated it in Luke chapter 9, verse 29. Luke 9, 29. So when you go into the place of prayer, you're beholding him. You are beholding him. And then you begin to cover. You begin to speak. You begin to pray. That glory begins to manifest in your life. Are you ready to enter into this dimension? In the name of Jesus, may you receive grace. Hallelujah. Number four, fellowship of his suffering. This one, this is the message we don't want to hear in this generation. We want quick money, quick traveling, disappear. <laughs> Man of God, I was preaching where the prayer worked. Hallelujah. The, pr the prayers you prayed for me, it worked. We saw healing. We saw the demonstration of the power of God. This one will come and give their testimony. I was born 70 years ago and I'm not even 40 and I'm preaching to them. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. John chapter 12 verse 23. 2 Corinthians 4 17. We are not reading them. 2 Corinthians 4 17 and 1 Peter 4 14. 1 Peter 4, 14. Fellowship of his suffering. Let's read 1 Peter 4, 14. When you are a child of God, be ready to suffer. Somebody say, I'm ready to suffer. You see, you didn't say it. You don't want to suffer. But as a Christian, you can't run away from suffering. You are suffering not because you are bad, but you are suffering for the name that you are believed in. The apostles suffered for the name. They beat them for the name. They drove them out of the temple because of the name of Jesus. And they warned them not to preach the name. Acts chapter 4, verse 28 downwards. But they went before God and prayed. But you, when we say you, be, when you if you, we go outside and we preach to people that when you accept Christ, you will suffer, they will never come. Hallelujah. <laughs> he says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. So your reproach and your suffering must be for the name of Jesus. You don't suffer for stealing. You don't suffer for your wrongs. You suffer because you are preaching Christ. You don't suffer before... <laughs> Remember, I won't say that one. <laughs> for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. So when you are suffering for your faith, when you are going through what you are going through because you are believing in Christ, the glory of the Lord is made manifest in your suffering. Hallelujah. And the last one is what? Faith. Somebody say faith. John chapter 11, 39 to 40. Jesus said to Martha and Mary, or said to Mary specifically, did I not tell you if you believe, you will what? See the glory of the Lord. So for you to see the glory, it takes faith. It takes a believing. If you don't believe, you can't see it. It is in you. You have received him. He has put that deposit in you. Until you start believing, until you start beholding, until you start meditating, until you start praying, and until you start going through the sufferings for your faith's sake, you will not see it. Start believing. Somebody say, I will believe. Please rise up on your feet. It's a good word. There is glory that is going to be revealed, but that glory is already inside of you. You can start walking in it before that day. Before that time comes. Do you know what the scripture says to us in 1 John chapter 3? It says, when he comes, we shall be like him. When we see him, we shall be like him. It means that there is something in us that looks like him. There is something already in you that looks like him. That will make you like you are like him. If Jesus appears and you don't look like him, because once he appears, the glory which is inside of you will come out. And it will begin to shine. And because he, has, he is coming in that glory, your glory and his own will now amalgamate. There will be a union. So you will now know that indeed you look like him. So when the man of sin appears, you will not look like him. The same way God became a man, Satan will also become a man. His name is the Antichrist. Hallelujah. But by then, me and you will not be here. We will be on the first flight. We in heaven already. Lift up your two hands and begin to give God glory.